I want to speak to you about what you need to do to keep the fire of God in your life. Five things you need to do to keep the fire of God. The first thing what I would like to highlight and that is the fire in the Bible was used to cook, to make metal, to offer sacrifices, to dispose contamination, uh, contamination or like to get rid of all kinds of diseases even and they would stop that by burning cities, burning clothes and other things and fire was actually used as a weapon. Fire is very important to our everyday life but in the Bible fire has these three very important things. One is it represents the presence of God. Many times we see God as a consuming fire. The Bible calls Him refiner's fire. God answers by fire. The first time God appeared to a human in the Scripture, He assumed the form of a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch when He appeared to Abraham. So God comes as fire to Moses in the form of a burning bush. Secondly, we see that God's Word is like a fire, Jeremiah 23. We also see thirdly that the Holy Spirit is like a fire. Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. In Thessalonians, Paul warns believers not to quench the Spirit. The word quench there is actually refers to extinguishing a fire. Let's review. Spiritually, fire speaks of the presence of God. It speaks of the Word of God and it speaks of the Holy Spirit who can be quenched. God, like a fire, wants to purify, wants to cleanse and wants to set our hearts, ignite us for Him. His Word wants to ignite us for Him and His Spirit wants to burn within us like a flame. Now here are seven things I want you to know about the fire and this will apply to the fire of God. These seven things will help you to know about the fire of God. Number one, fire brings light. Number two, fire brings heat. Number three, fire brings purging. Number four, fire needs fuel. Number five, fire spreads. Number six, fire can die. And number seven, fire produces smoke. But smoke does not produce fire. So let's go over them just in a little bit more of a detail. Number one is fire brings light. You know when you have fire you start having light. One of the reasons people had fire in practically was to light up a room. I believe the Bible calls us the light of the world. How can we be the light of the world if we don't have flame, if we don't have fire? One of the things that God's fire in you does is it lights you up to light your world for God. Secondly is fire brings heat. The heat speaks of love. You know when, when you set up a fire in your house for example through fireplace you feel warm, you feel good, right? When you have fire in your life as a Christian there's a sense of God's love that flows in you and through you to the world. You feel a sense of the warmth of God. Now God's love is not just something we feel but it's also something that we can feel. God's love, Jesus says in the last days, will get colder in people's lives, meaning the love will get cold in many people's lives and God doesn't want this fire to die out in your life because when it dies out your love for Jesus, the love of Jesus in you, experiential love of Jesus in you gets colder and then people cannot experience that through you. The reason why fire is important thirdly is because fire purges, fire refines, fire cleanses. When you get the fire of God in your life, there's a cleansing that begins to take place. There's a purging that begins to take place. Fourthly is the fire of God. God starts it but you must keep it because it needs fuel. Practical fire or domestic fire, if you start a fire in your backyard, uh, you gather the family around, you know one thing is that if you don't put any wood on it, if you don't put any fuel on it, it dies. So fire needs fuel, fire needs wood. 
And I have a lot of messages where I deal about different fuels that we need for the fire. And today I'm going to share five things that will be specifically relating to this thing, to keep the fire burning on the altar. The fifth thing that I mentioned about what we need to learn about the fire is the fire spread. See, when the fire you keep becomes the fire that spreads. I live in Washington State and we just had a serious situation actually where there was a lot of smoke in the air and the reason why we had a lot of smoke in the air is because somebody started a fire and this fire spread. Because of the dry area that we live in, this fire started to spread to the point that the smoke actually touched states, cities. And thank God for the rain and because of the rain that smoke evaporated and it was gone. But fire spreads. When you catch on fire for Jesus, when God burns in you, you will see that you will lit, light other people on fire. When a pastor is burning for Jesus, he lights his church on fire. When a father is burning for Jesus, he lights his family on fire. And the more dry they are, the better they burn. Fire can also die. This, that's the sixth truth about the fire. Meaning somebody can come and extinguish it. That's why the Bible says do not quench the Spirit, meaning you can quench fire, you can extinguish it, you can bring and kill it with water. There are things that directly kill fire. Yes, it can spread, yes it needs wood, but it can also be extinguished. That's why we have a whole department in our city called firefighters, people who fight fires, people who end fires, people who stop fires and people who extinguish fires. And there are some of us, we have habits in our life, we have people in our life who come and they're like sent by the devil to kill the fire, to extinguish the fire. We're not firefighters, we are fire starters. Now, spiritually speaking, amen, so drop this in the chat. I am not a firefighter, I am a fire starter. So fire brings light, fire brings heat, fire brings purging, fire needs fuel, fire spreads, Fire can be extinguished and fire produces smoke. But smoke doesn't produce fire. Now by smoke right now, smoke is not something very pleasant. Smoke is not fun. When you get on fire for God, it attracts criticism. It attracts naysayers. It attracts people who will not understand you. People who will criticize you. People who sometimes out of ignorance and some people with ill intent will try to stop you and will try to actually confuse you and, and, and they will try to spread rumors about you. Just because you're on fire for God, please understand it does not mean that it will not attract smoke or it will not produce smoke. There will be always people who will not understand. This has happened from the beginning. Cain and Abel, I mean two brothers, there's no other human beings on this earth except their family. One guy gets on fire for God, brings a sacrifice, his brother doesn't like it. Bam! Kills him. And from that point on, we saw anytime people get on fire for God, there's always an opposition, there's always this smoke. Some people just don't like it. And some people just get bent on this thing to stop you and destroy you. It's the smoke, I call it the smoke and we shouldn't be discouraged by that and this smoke should not stop us. This crit critics should not cause us to quit. People who persecute us should not cause us to give up. Fire produces smoke. The smoke could also mean fire can produce different traditions. Fire can produce different routines, rhythms, ideologies, the way God uses you. It's dangerous to turn those methods, formulas into, excuse me, it's dangerous to allow the way God uses you to become a formula, to become something that you hold on to. God's move is so genuine, so precious, it's so amazing but we should not make it into some kind of a formula out of it. Sometimes even when it happens with healing, it happens with deliverance, it happens with, with the move of the Holy Spirit and people love to make traditions. 
traditions are not bad. Fire produces smoke. I really believe that if you genuinely love Jesus, you will have certain routines and certain rhythms and you will have certain traditions that you're going to develop, certain way, the way you're going to pray, the way you're going to fast, the way you're going to just get engaged with the things of God and that's good. That's smoke. Make sure you don't make those into laws. Make sure you don't make those into these things that actually begin to take the place of the Scripture. Those things, they, they need to be evaporated and they're going to be gone. The Scripture, Holy Spirit is that fire. The Bible is that fire. The presence of God is that fire. Not my way of fasting. Not my way of reading the Bible. Not even my way of casting out demons. Not my way of healing the sick. My way is not the only way. My way is not the way. My way is not the way. Jesus is the way, not me. So the way I burn for Jesus, I cannot make it into some kind of a legalistic law that everybody has to do that. For example, let's take example of the fasting. You know, I'm encouraging and inviting everyone to take those three days of fasting. And I believe a lot of you are listening to this, you're like, you know what? My spirit responds, let's do it. But we should not make it into a legalism. If somebody who maybe doesn't fast, oh, they don't love Jesus. Oh, if somebody doesn't do it the same way that I'm doing at this season right now, that means they're, they're far from God. That means they, they will not go to heaven. That means God is not close to them. That is the furthest thing from the truth. Be careful that your fire that produces smoke doesn't cause other people to choke. Be careful that your passion for Jesus Christ doesn't also lead to legalism and producing traditions and rituals that you become so committed to that even when the fire has died, you still have smoke. And the last thing, fire leaves ashes. I'm going to add that as I'm speaking right now, I'm reminded of something that when you lose fire, you get ashes. Ashes are the sign that fire is gone. Fire leaves ashes and some people have no more fire, just ashes. What does that mean? That means that they only have memories of things used to be like this for the Lord but they're no longer like that. If you lose fire, you get ashes and my desire today is that you don't have ashes but you have fire. God even told priests to constantly remove ashes from the altar so that the fire can constantly be burning. Fresh fire all the time, new passion for Jesus, new love. God wants to renew you. God doesn't want you to live on the miracles of yesterday. He wants you to live on a relationship with Him of today. Yesterday's manna will develop warms. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus doesn't say every word that proceeded. We live by the rhema word, meaning God still speaks through His word today. If Abraham would have lived on yesterday's fire, he would have killed Isaac because God told Abraham to offer his son. And Abraham came to offer his son, but Abraham stayed connected to the Lord listening to God now, connecting to God now and guess what happened? Right there God said, Abraham, don't kill your son. If Abraham would have lived on yesterday's manna, he would have killed his son. If he would have only lived on yesterday's fire, it wouldn't produce heat, light, purging, it would just be ashes. Let me ask you a question, dear believer, brother and sister in Christ, does your altar have fire or does your altar only have ashes? Has your love for Jesus become a memory of the past or has your love for Jesus burning brighter, clearer every year and every month? Are your memories bigger than your dreams? Are your fears bigger than your faith? Is your future bigger than your past? Is there fire on your altar or just ashes? Ashes mean there used to be fire here 
And so many people, while I love what the Lord has done in the past, I love to remember what God has done. But those memories are to kindle my desires to burn for Jesus more. They are not a capstone. They are not my ceiling. They are not, oh, I used to love the Lord. I used to pray. I used to give. I used to fast. I used to evangelize. I used to read the Word. I, Vlad, that stuff that you're talking about, yeah, I, I, I used to do that. That means your altar has no more flame, just ashes. It's time to remove those ashes and I believe by the end of this stream Jesus is going to kindle a fresh fire in your heart. Drop this in the chat. We don't want ashes. We want fire. We don't want smoke. We want fire. We want this fire to spread. We want this fire not to die but we need to fuel this fire. So let's review and then I'm going to share with you five things to keep this fire. So things you need to know about the fire of God is the fire of God brings light, number one. The fire of God brings heat, number two. The fire of God brings purging, number three. The fire of God needs fuel, number four. The fire spreads, number five. The fire can be extinguished, number six. The fire produces smoke, number seven. And the fire, once it dies, leaves ashes. God wants you to live, live for Him, be a light for Him. That happens through the fire. God wants you to live with love. That happens through that heat. God wants you to be purged. That happens through that Word. God's Word is like a fire. God's Spirit is like a fire. God's presence is like a fire. That fire needs fuel. That means you need to put the Word on the altar so that the fire will be burning according to Leviticus chapter 6, verse 13. The fire will spread. It's contagious. Other people will catch it. But the fire can be extinguished. The Thessalonians, it says, don't grieve the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. It speaks about quenching. It speaks about extinguishing the fire. That We have firefighters. Fire produces smoke. We've said that when you begin to burn on fire for Jesus, people will not understand you sometimes. Some people will criticize you. But keep burning for Jesus. Don't get distracted. And fire leaves ashes when it's gone. Don't ever be a Christian that only has memories but doesn't have dreams only has memories of the past but no longer has passion in the present. My desire through this stream to rekindle, to kindle that passion in you. My desire that you will be like those disciples who were leaving Jerusalem and when Jesus talked to them about the Scriptures and they remembered how Jesus talked, they said, wasn't our heart burning? Come on somebody, drop this in the chat. God, give me a burning heart. Now, Let's look at the five things that you can do to keep the fire of God in your life. Number one, focus on Jesus' love for you more than on your love for Jesus. I will use the story of Peter, how Peter renounced and left Jesus. Of course, it was temporarily. He was an apostle. He was already casting out demons. He was already healing the sick. Peter was already moving in signs and wonders. And Peter was very close to God, very close to God. He was one of these outspoken disciples. Man, he was great. But there came a time in his life and everything seemed to be lost. And I will take you through the progression of how Peter lost it. Because through that we learn how not to lose it and how to keep it. And I believe if you keep it, God will multiply it. One of the mistakes that Peter was making in Matthew 26 verse 33 to 34 is that Jesus said to Peter, all of you will be made stumble because of me. And of course, Peter answered and said, even if everyone stumbles, I will never be made to stumble. Peter was overconfident in his ability to keep himself in God. Peter was overconfident in his ability to burn for God. He was overconfident in his ability to be on fire for God. Now something I want to share with you that might seem contradictory and some of you are not going to like to hear that right now. But that is this. If you want to love Jesus more, focus less on your love for Jesus and more on His love for you. 
Drop this in the chat. If you want to love Jesus more, focus less on your love for Jesus and more on His love for you. Why? Because 1 John 4.19, it says we love Him because He first loved us. You are not the source of fire. You're only the resource. The source is God. The source is His presence. The source is His Word and the source is His Spirit. Therefore, the more you get obsessed with how little you love Jesus, you will get discouraged. If you get focused on how much you love Jesus, you will get overconfident and you will have an inflated self-worth, inflated overconfidence. But if you love Jesus and you focus on how much He loves you, your love for Him will grow. One of the biggest things that I personally learned about burning on fire for Jesus Christ is this. The more I focus on how much I love Jesus, the less I will love Him. Less I focus on how much I love Jesus, the more His love flows through me and His fire begins to increase. I'm not the source of fire. He is. When you focus on your love for Jesus more than His love for you, four things will happen. You will begin to make empty promises instead of living in His presence. Like Peter, I will never die. Excuse me, I will, Jesus, I will never deny you. That's a bunch of empty promises because He broke that promise. You will begin to try to earn God's love, trying to prove to other people you're better than other people instead of living out of God's love and living not to prove but living out of the place of you're accepted, you're loved, you have nothing to prove. You don't need to prove anything. A third thing will happen if you focus much on your love for Jesus is you will live in your emotions but your devotion will be weak. The fourth thing will happen if you focus more on your love for Jesus than His love for you is you will have a lot of passion but your passion will lack compassion. Peter, in his passion for Jesus, cut somebody's ear off. How could you do that? Loving Jesus so much but not loving other people. Because see, your love for Jesus, if it's not anchored in His love for you, will cut other people. It will lack devotion. It will lack commitment because it will be hype, not real commitment. It will try to prove something. The fasting, the prayer, the Bible reading is to prove, look how spiritual I am. God will love me more. Kind of like Leah was doing to Jacob birthing a lot of children so that he will love her and that never changed. She never felt more loved by him when she gave him more children. We don't earn God's love, we receive God's love. We don't pray fast, give or serve or fulfill certain duties. When God gives us certain blessings, they are not so we can use this as a proving point to our enemies or even our friends. Look, I'm successful. Look, I'm amazing. Look, I'm spiritual. I pray, I fast. All of that shows that we're doing it from the wrong place. Not from a bad place, just not a good place. The, the place of Peter, the place of I focus on my love for Jesus instead of I focus on His love for me. We begin to make a lot of promises and man, we break them. You know who was different than Peter? It was John. If you read the Gospel of John, John would refer to himself as a disciple Jesus loved. John, why don't you refer to yourself as a disciple that loved Jesus? That's more spiritual. That's more applaudable. But John looked at his love for Jesus and then looked at Jesus' love for John and said, Jesus' love for me is so much greater. My love is not worth focusing on. I'm going to focus on Jesus' love. And therefore, my identity is going to be a disciple Jesus loved. Come on, somebody, drop this in the chat. I'm a disciple Jesus loves. We have a generation today that loves to brag about their titles. I'm not against titles. 
pastor, bishop, apostle, whatever your title is, prophet, seer, demon slayer. You know what my favorite title? A disciple Jesus loves. I don't want to brag about how much I love God because I checked how much He loves me and His love is greater. And because His love is greater, I don't need to live my life to prove anything. I don't need to be successful to feel more loved. I am loved the way I am. I don't need to fix my eyes to feel accepted by God. Therefore, to be accepted in my own heart. If you want to burn for God, you must take your eyes off of what you're doing for Him and gaze on what He did for you, how much He loves you, whether you fast or you don't, whether your prayer life is strong or needs tweaking, whether your life in the Word is as strong as you want it to be or not as strong. His love is unconditional. His love is unfailing. His love, his love is as wide as the ocean. He loves you. How I know that? Because the Bible tells me so. Jesus says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. If you experience that love, you will love Jesus more. If you don't experience that love, your love will never be enough. Your love will produce discouragement or overconfidence, but it will always lead you to one place, failure. It will extinguish your fire. So that's the first thing. Drop this in the chat. Focus on Jesus' love for you more than on your love for Jesus. If this is helping somebody, drop a fire emoji in the chat. If you're watching, re-watching this, go ahead and hit like to this stream. And then share this on Facebook if you are watching and re-watching this as well. Let's go to the second thing that you must do to keep on fire for God. The second one is you must wake up your prayer life. So now that I dealt with the most important foundation and that is we take our eyes off of our love for God, we fix them on His love, on His love for us. The second thing now, let's get to some practical things and the second one is to wake up your prayer life. Or in other words, wake up your devotional life. Jesus speaks to Peter and says, Peter, um, everybody's going to deny me. Of course, Peter is overconfident. He says, no, I'll never deny you. He wants to pretty much prove to other people, Jesus, I love you better than other people. And that's the wrong way to go about it. And the first way that Peter fails is in this overconfident pride. The second way Peter fails is Jesus takes Peter to a prayer meeting. Of course it was dark, it was night and it wasn't easy and the Bible says he came back and he found disciples sleeping. But I find it interesting, he addresses Peter. He says, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Matthew 26, 40. He doesn't rebuke the disciples. In this instance, he rebukes Peter. In Luke 22, 31, 32, Right before this incident, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So right before they go into this garden where Jesus is praying, I mean, imagine being in a prayer meeting with Jesus. Prayer is very powerful. Like I think it was A.W. Tozer said that he said, uh, let me be with the person when they pray and I'll tell you a lot about a man. To be in somebody's prayer meeting privately when they pray, like I don't let people come into, only Jacko, my dog, is the only one that comes to my devotional time and my wife maybe. But I don't feel comfortable. I don't want people to be. That's a private thing. That's like, that's like intimacy with God. It's just, that's not for the public to see nor is it for the public to witness. Jesus invites His closest disciples to a very intimate moment. They're about to see Him sweat blood. Jesus is not asking Him to watch only. He says watch and pray because they're about to go through their temptation. But right before this meeting, Jesus tells Peter, He says, Simon, Simon, interesting, 
Jesus refers to Peter as Simon. He changed his name from Simon to Peter. You know, Simon means unstable, shaky, and Peter means a rock, a little rock. And now Jesus refers to Peter by his old name. I find that interesting. Could it be that when they went to prayer and Peter went to sleep instead of praying, his old life came back, instability came back? Because then you see Peter denying Jesus. You see Peter saying nonsense, Peter chopping somebody's ear off. I do believe when your devotional life goes to sleep, your past life wakes up. Drop this in the chat. When your devotional life goes to sleep, your past life wakes up. Simon, Simon, Satan asked for you. Jesus says, but I prayed for you. There was just only one problem with Peter. Peter didn't pray, so Satan prayed. In other words, Satan asked. Jesus prayed. Peter did not pray. Do you know that the enemy, like I don't know how if he still does that, but I do believe that the enemy wants to destroy us. Jesus is interceding for us. But the real win in our life is not going to depend on whether Jesus is interceding or Satan is trying to attack us. The question now is, are you going to pray? Can you wake up your devotional life? Wake up your devotional life. Even if it's five minutes a day, 50 minutes a day, 15 minutes, whatever that is, keep your devotional life awake. You know, for many of us, there are these, I call them, a lot of people call them keystone habits. It's this one thing that you do during the day that pretty much creates a domino effect for the rest of the things. For some people, it's waking up right away and drinking a glass of water and going for a run. And after that, they can do their devotions, they can exercise and they can do other stuff. For me, the keystone habit for me is waking up right away and going to read the Bible. And then after that, I can do all of the other stuff. I can pray and after that, I'll memorize my verses and then I will have my little short exercise. I don't exercise a lot as you can probably witness or see. Um, but just enough to, to stay in shape and to stay um, uh, physically fit. And so for some people, it's the opposite. They have to exercise first. And this is not wrong. This is not against the Bible that if you go and exercise first and then you do the devotions. Uh, what I'm saying is whatever you need to do to keep your devotional life awakened, do that. Find your rhythm. Find what gets you into that place and respect that, honor that, protect that. Because if you don't pray, you will stray. If you don't pray, if you sleep, something else wakes up. If you spiritually sleep, how do we spiritually sleep? Nobody goes to spiritually asleep until they first let their devotional life go to sleep. Let me say that again. Nobody goes to sleep spiritually without their devotional life going to sleep first. When your devotional life goes to sleep, your past life begins to wake up. I'm not saying you start doing the things you got delivered from, God brought you from. What I'm saying is a lot of times those temptations intensify. Those things you got freed from, things you left, they seem to be coming back at a faster pace. Because while our old man is dead, a lot of times we hold the resurrection power by putting our new man to sleep. How do we put our new men to sleep? How do we spiritually fall asleep? By putting our devotional life to sleep. Jesus says, abide in me and let my words abide in you. That abiding is not just some kind of a belief that you have. There is a practical part. As a Christian, you feed your spirit with the Word of God. You feed your spiritual men with prayer. You feed yourself when you read other things, when you're watching this broadcast as well, though this doesn't come near to the importance that God's Word plays in our life, but it comes as like a supplement and it helps us to keep our devotional life awakened so that our past life can stay asleep, dead, and our spiritual life can be vibrant. Is this helping anybody? Drop number one in the chat. If point number two, you connect with that, you say, man, this was for me. 
drop that fire emoji if you're enjoying this teaching. If you are re-watching or just tuning in, I welcome you. Don't forget to hit like and share this broadcast with other people. We've shared to review that fire is important. God's presence is like fire. God's Word is like fire. God's Spirit is like fire. We've shared eight things about the fire of God. The fire brings light, fire brings heat, fire brings purging, fire needs fuel, fire spreads, fire can be extinguished and fire can produce smoke and fire leaves ashes when it's gone. And we mentioned five things that you need to do to keep the fire. The first one is focus on Jesus' love for you more than on your love for Jesus. The second one is wake up your devotional life. Now let's go to the third one. Don't follow the Holy Spirit at a distance to avoid sacrifice. The third thing is don't follow the Holy Spirit at a distance by avoiding sacrifice. What does this mean? That means a lot of people follow the Holy Spirit at a distance. What does it mean to follow the Holy Spirit at a distance? It's when you only follow the Holy Spirit at your convenience. Don't follow the Holy Spirit only when it's convenient. Drop this in the chat. Don't follow the Holy Spirit only when it's convenient. A lot of people love to follow Jesus when it's convenient. You cannot keep the fire if you only follow God when it's comfortable, convenient and costs you nothing. Now in the beginning stages of a walk with Christ, sometimes following Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit's promptings is very easy. It comes so much easier. And then there's leadings of God, teachings from the Scripture that lead us into some sacrifice, lead us into some things that cost us. And if you stop short of that and you say, I'm not going to go further, guess what's going to happen? You lose the fire. Now let's look at Peter. Peter in Matthew 26 verse uh, 58, it says this, but Peter followed him, look at this, at a distance. So Peter is overconfident in his ability to love Jesus. Peter then begins to sleep, his devotional life is sleeping. Then I want you to notice what begins to happen. He used to be so close to Jesus. As long as Jesus was healing the sick, walking on water, as long as Jesus was raising the dead, as long as Jesus multiplied bread, as long as Jesus called Peter an apostle, as long as Jesus sent Peter to cast out demons, Peter was very close to Jesus. But now following Jesus can get you killed. But now following Jesus can get you on the wrong side with the Pharisees, with the Roman law, with the Romans. So guess what Peter's doing? What everyone does who only serves Jesus when it's convenient. Follow Him at a distance. And that's how you don't keep fire. Follow Him at a distance. We have a generation today that leaves marriages when they get hard. They stop going to church when they get offended. They stop sacrificing because it's not convenient. That's why many people don't fast. Why? Because, well, it's not convenient. (laughs) That's why many of us uh, don't give uh, to the church. We don't partner with the ministries. We don't support any other causes. Really, let's just be honest. It's just, it's just not convenient. It's just, can I give you a 21st century word? It's not fun. Okay. It doesn't give me anything. It seems like, uh, yeah, it's just not fun. And so for those of us who are addicted to fun, for those of us who are addicted to a constant, uh, surge of, Uh, high, good feeling, Uh, moments like these of following Jesus when He's going to get persecuted and then killed, we kind of stay, we keep a distance. We're not leaving Him, we're just keeping our distance. I know many Christians who come to church still every Sunday, but they and Jesus are at a distance. Oh yeah, they confess Him. Oh yes, they sing the songs. Oh yes, I believe they're going to heaven but they are following Jesus at a distance because they're afraid of losing something for Jesus. Jesus made it very clear. Matthew 16, 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow me. 
For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you only follow Jesus because it brings you success, it costs you nothing, then you're following Him at a distance. You're playing safe, trying to keep your life. Most of us don't have a problem giving up our addiction, toxic relationship, a really bad habit. But those things are not sacrifices. I heard people sometimes like, man, I, get, I, I sacrifice alcohol. Are you kidding me? Alcohol could kill you. Oh, I sacrifice drugs. That stuff is addictive. That's not a sacrifice. Now, I know it felt like a sacrifice, but that's not a real cost. You give up something that is hurting you. But giving up yourself, giving up something that's good, that's a sacrifice. Sacrifice is not giving up sin. That's like normal. That's like, it's good, praise God, but that's not sacrifice. I think sacrifice is when we give something that's good for something that's better. Jesus, more of Him, less of us. And so many of us know how to give our sin. We just don't know how to give ourselves. Drop this in the chat. It's easier to give up sin than to give up self. And when you give up self, when you lay yourself on the altar, you bridge the distance between you and the Holy Spirit. But the moment you try to protect yourself, not lose yourself, I'm going to keep myself, you will begin to seek and see distance between you and the Holy Spirit. Because He will lead you in things that will cost you things. He will lead you in things that they're just not going to be fun sometimes. But that's where the true intimacy is. That's where the true fire is. So don't follow the Holy Spirit only when it's convenient. Follow Him even when it costs you something. Drop this in the chat. Don't follow the Holy Spirit only when it's convenient. Follow Him even if it costs you something. Now let's go to number four. The fourth thing about how to keep the fire and that is this, avoid numbing yourself with world's flame. Avoid numbing yourself with world's flame. So let's review. Peter is overconfident in his ability to love Jesus. John is different. John says, I'm disciple of Jesus that Jesus loves. Peter's like, no, I'm, I'm never going to deny Jesus. I'm going to die for Jesus. Jesus is like, ah, uh, yeah, not going to happen. Makes a lot of promises, doesn't live them. His passion lacks compassion, a lot of emotionalism, very little devotion. And Peter's devotional life goes to sleep. And then Peter, unlike three and a half years, who followed Jesus very close, now he's keeping a distance with Jesus. Why? Because for the first time in three and a half years, yes, Peter gave up the boat, he gave up the fish, but now his life is on the line. You know, not just the fish, not just the boat. And let's give credit to Peter and to the disciples. They gave a lot to follow Jesus. But what made Peter scared is that he might lose his life. And Satan said this to God about Job. He says, yeah, Job will be okay with, you know, his kids dying, even though, you know, it's painful. But then God, Satan said to God, he says, touch him. He said, you'll see, he'll curse you. Touch him. And a lot of us are afraid of giving ourselves up, our way, dying to ourselves. I heard one person said one time, Jesus is worthy of everything you're afraid of losing. Drop this in the chat. Jesus is worthy of every, everything you're afraid of losing. So now Peter's following Jesus at a distance. Jesus is being prosecuted. You know, they're leveling all kinds of false accusations against Jesus. And I want you to see where Peter is at. In Mark chapter 14, verse 54, it says, Peter followed Jesus at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. Okay. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Remember, we're talking about keeping the fire. 
John 18, 18 says this, Now the servants and the officers who made a fire of coals and there, but it was cold, and they warmed themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Wow. Okay, Peter. Okay, so now Peter is hanging out with Roman soldiers, with people that he has no relationship with, with the officers, and he's warming himself in their flame. Now, I want you to notice three things about this fire. It's attractive, it's addicting, and it's annihilating. Attractive? Because you want to fit in. The world's fire is attractive. Alcohol, pornography, drugs, um, all kinds of bad entertainment, new age. There is a level of attractiveness to it. Come on, let's be honest. You're cold because you're distant from the Lord. Perhaps devotional life is sleeping and things that you would say no to if you would be on fire for God are things that we begin to entertain. Things that we begin to say, well, I'm just gonna warm myself. I'm just gonna do it just a little bit. I'm just gonna see how close I can get without falling. You know, it's, I'm not a legalist and stuff. So I'm not like those, you know, legalists. Uh, everything is allowed to me. And we begin to play all these games in our head. But in reality, distance leads to the fact that we begin to numb ourselves by warming yourself in the wrong fire pit. It's attractive. When you lose your affection for Jesus, world becomes more attractive. Drop this in the chat. When you lose your affection for Jesus, the world becomes more attractive. The world is not attractive. It's that what keeps the attraction away is affection for Jesus, His love, his passion and our love for Him. But the less affection, the less passion we have for Jesus, the more the world becomes attractive. You know, when you become on fire Christian, the things that attract the world, playing video games non-stop, drinking, watching pornography, you know, smoking, getting high, sleeping around, going to parties, all of these things, they're like repulsive. It's like, blah. It's like, no, I don't want to do that stuff. Why, I, I don't have time for that. That's just, no, no. Why is it not attractive? It's not because like you're super spiritual. It's just because there's something else that is satisfying the craving and the longing, the pure fire of Jesus. But when you are kind of like Peter drifting and devotional life is asleep, kind of only follow Jesus when it's convenient, you're no longer paying the, any price at all, you find yourself numbing yourself, you find yourself being okay at the world's flame and it's addictive because three times Peter denies Jesus. Where? At that fire. The world's fire gets you hooked it's not just like, oh, it's just one bad weekend. Then it becomes second bad weekend, becomes another bad weekend. Oh, it's just one time and then it becomes the second time, the third time, because there's a hook with the world's fire. And the world's fire is annihilating, meaning it annihilates your intimacy with God. The Bible says that Jesus, when He was passing by, He looked at Peter and Peter wept because He knew that connection now is broken. It doesn't mean that Peter didn't get loved by Jesus, it's just that, that thing that he had with Jesus. He just broke it three times. But how did he get to that place? Overconfidence in himself, devotional life asleep, then only following Jesus when it's convenient and has no cost attached to him. And now Instead of nurturing his spiritual person, he is numbing himself by feeding his flesh, by warming himself at the wrong fire.
Let me ask you a question. Are you edifying yourself or are you entertaining yourself? Are you nurturing yourself or are you numbing yourself? Is your affection for Jesus causing the world no longer to be attractive? Or the world is so attractive and Jesus is yeah, kind of dull, there's no color to it. The Lord wants to change that today. The Lord wants to change that today. The last thing I'm going to share, how to keep the fire. Number one, focus on Jesus' love for you more than on your love for Jesus. Number two, wake up your devotional life. Number three, follow the Holy Spirit even when it's not convenient. Number four, learn to nurture your spiritual life instead of numb yourself with the world's flame. And number five, repentance is the key to the restoration. Repentance is the key. No matter where you are, you can always get the fire back. There's one key. It's repentance. It's not remorse because remorse makes things worse. Drop this in the chat. Remorse makes things worse. The Bible says that the godly sorrow produces repentance. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of this world produces death, 2 Corinthians 7, 10. Restitution is making things right without getting right with Jesus, will not get you very far. Judas did that. He brought all the stuff, the money back and then hanged himself. Guilt, remorse, shame is not going to make things better. Punishing yourself ain't going to get you better. Saying, oh, I'm going to try harder is not going to get you very far. What do you do? You got to do what Peter did. John 21 verse 9, it says, Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus meets Peter at that point that he blew it, lost his fire, only had ashes. He lost that connection to the Lord. He denounced him. He, even, he, he denied him three times. He went back to fishing. We don't know if it's him going back to his old life or him just, you know, picking up something to do so that he doesn't just, you know, sit and do nothing. But Jesus meets him right at that point. <laughs> I find it interesting. Peter denies Jesus at the fire and Peter reaffirms his love for Jesus at the fire. There was one fire at Jesus' trial where Peter lost it. But there was another fire at Jesus' triumph where Peter was restored. What I love Peter's story for is that Peter was a follower of Christ. Peter was a minister. Peter was an apostle. Peter was not a sinner. Peter was a backslider. Peter fell. And this encourages me because it tells me that if you lost the fire, you can get it back through repentance. Repentance restores it. In fact, I would go as far as to say, never outgrow your need for repentance. Repentance has to become your lifestyle. Yes, Jesus has taken care of our sins on the cross, but if you live a life that is not repentant, then most likely you're living your life in some deception. You think that you don't have any problems. You don't have any shortages. You never take ownership of the mess that you make. And if you're married to a person who never repents, man, that's hard. Because intimacy cannot be established if people don't repent. The only person who doesn't need to repent is God. We do because we fall short. And like Peter, we can have a rough week. That was just one week Peter went from great apostle to a big backslider. But what I loved about Peter is Jesus didn't cast Peter out. 
he restored him at the fire. And Peter, some 50 days later, got filled with the fire of God, preached the sermon, and he never backslid again. The history tells us that during the great fire of Rome in the year of 64, three months after Nero, on the 10th anniversary of that, of his ascension to throne, there was so much bloodshed and Peter was in Rome. He was escaping actually. And then there's different reports, but one of them is that Peter saw an angel that, that, that told him that to return back to Rome only to be crucified. But not only crucified, when he was being crucified, he asked the people who crucified him, he says, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. And they crucified him upside down. He was restored. You can be too. You can be renewed. No matter how far you've fallen, no matter how long it has been, no matter where you've been, Jesus Christ, He doesn't just save sinners, He restores backsliders. The prodigal son story, it was a son that backslid. Peter's story, it was an apostle that lost his flame, went into the fire of the world, started to walk with Jesus at a distance, had his devotional life asleep, but the Peter we read, in book of Acts, he boasted in Jesus' love for him. His devotional life was awakened. He's the one that said, we must not leave prayer in the ministry of the Word for ministering at the tables. Peter followed Jesus to the cross and was crucified. And Peter strengthened other people. If you lost that flame, can we pray right now? And if you are burning for God, I hope that this gave you tools how to stay on fire for Him. Let's review. Focus more on His love for you, less on your love for Him. And your love for Him will grow. Awaken or wake up your devotional life. Number three is don't follow Jesus only when it's convenient. There will be times following God where it's just going to be hard. Don't drop it. Don't go and try to protect your life. You're still going to lose it when you die. Sometimes we lose our selfishness, our way, and it's okay. That's what it means to carry the cross. Fourthly, is don't go into numbing. Go into nurturing. Don't go into entertainment. Go into edifying yourself. And fourthly, never outgrow your need for repentance. Keep repenting keep growing. I'm not saying to go on constant fishing expedition looking for sin. But what I'm saying is that we have to come to God's presence asking His blood to cleanse us and confess our sins. It's part of the Lord's Prayer as well, especially when He brings something to the, to the heart. We examine ourselves. Why? So we can be sanctified. So not so that we don't go to hell, but so that we live close to Jesus. When I repent to my wife, I don't do it so she doesn't divorce me. I do it so that we stay closer to each other. When I make a mistake, when I say something, when I do something and it grieves her, I repent genuinely. There's not a thought in my mind that, oh, if, if I don't do that right now, she's going to file for divorce. I don't do that for that. I do that for intimacy. We don't repent because we lose salvation. Especially when we are Christians walking with the Lord, we repent because we want to be intimate with Him. I'm not talking about the people right now who walked away from Christ. If you walked away from Christ, that's a different story. But if you are walking with Jesus and you, you notice that there were things that done or things left undone and they were just not, not right and guilt is eating you up, shame is eating you up, Jesus tells us to repent. And when we repent, we receive the restoration of that connection, of that intimacy, that connection to Jesus. The joy begins to flood our heart again. Peace begins to come and our hearts catch fire. Amen. Let's pray. If you have received, this was a blessing to you. Um, drop number one in the chat. I know that this fast is going to be different. 
there's going to be a fire uh, that's going to be released even right now and so um drop that fire emoji if um this has been a great teaching that's been blessing to you and right now let's let's begin to pray let's begin to pray i'm seeing your fire emojis i'm seeing your number ones as well um for those of you on facebook as well as on youtube let's begin to right now press into jesus and let's begin to pray drop that prayer emoji if you're gonna be in agreement with prayer my prayer is that god's gonna restore those that lost it my prayer is that god's gonna bring you back and as you're maybe some of you need to take this time to fast next three days and just press into jesus just repent some of you may be during this fasting you need to just examine your heart god wants to just bring cleansing purification this is not a guilt message this is not a legalist message this is an intimacy message this is a fire message lord jesus i ask you right now that your precious presence is going to invade this live stream holy spirit i ask you that your anointing will come right now i pray for those like peter they found themselves at the wrong fire i pray for those that are like peter they found themselves distancing themselves from you lord pray for those whose devotional life has gone to sleep and has been snoring already i pray for those who have found themselves numbing themselves with alcohol numbing themselves with entertainment numbing themselves with overeating numbing themselves with movies tv shows numbing themselves with video games even doing things that are might not be sinful but but things that they, they know they're numbing themselves they're running from something dear jesus as you restored peter could you restore that person right now i pray for the ministers i pray for those that have a great calling like peter but they found themselves in this fog they found themselves in this funk they found themselves in this valley the enemy has sifted them their faith is being shaken their fire seems to be extinguished Jesus you see their tears you see their brokenness I ask you right now that you hear the repentance I pray may you bring restoration may you bring restoration when you reset them may you renew may you kindle that fire again may they live differently now not looking to themselves but looking to Jesus may they live differently now keeping their prayer life their devotional life awake following you where you lead not just where they're comfortable prioritizing nurturing themselves spiritually edifying themselves spiritually and living a life of repentance not letting those things go prolonged without us addressing them in our prayer in the name of Jesus Lord I pray that those who found themselves in their old cycle of sin and guilt and remorse and shame is eating them up I ask you right now in the name of Jesus precious Holy Spirit would you would you bring the blood of Jesus as you see their repentance as you see their brokenness would you renew the joy of your salvation would you restore to them the right spirit would you cleanse them would you purify them would you light a fire once again would you wash their past in Jesus name in Jesus mighty name hallelujah somebody drop this in the chat I receive I receive I believe Jesus is moving we're gonna take time to pray for healing and deliverance in the next few days of our fast today was mainly for the spiritual renewal and for the Holy Spirit to come and fill us so I pray that for those some of you will need to re-watch this few times and this will become like a blessing to your spiritual journey with Christ share this with other people share this with your small group share this with uh, people that you are connected with so that they can catch the flame and they can walk on fire for Jesus Christ amen was this a blessing for you guys wanted to give an opportunity right now to people that have 
received a blessing from this teaching. I want you to consider um, sowing or financially supporting our ministry. In our ministry we have not just one YouTube channel, we have a Russian YouTube channel, Spanish YouTube channel, my wife's YouTube channel, the English YouTube channel that's about to reach a million subscribers. We're reaching millions of people on YouTube. We have a solid team. A lot of people are surprised how a pastor can do that. There is a grace of God, but I would say it's not just the grace of God, it's also a team. A team that's actively working, but this team is supported by you guys. So I just want to say thank you and I want to invite you to be a part of this team by your prayer and by your financial contribution. You can become a partner for something as little as what you would pay for Netflix subscription every month, but it will go a long way to help us reach more people for Christ. Or you can give one time your best gift. Not only we have videos, we also produce, I produce books. Once a year, I release a book and this is I think a fifth one or sixth one already. In fact, this year there was one on fasting and this is on the Holy Spirit. Now, why this is significant is because these books are offered free of charge. So when they come out, people are able to download them on our website. In Russian and Spanish, we involve other people to translate it in other languages. We have a team that works on that and this helps us because of your giving. The third thing that we have that is powerful and that is Vlad's school. We have online school with courses that we release every few months and they're free of charge. They're quality courses that we offer for people, small groups, colleges even, download them and use them, Bible schools and Christians just get equipped. Over 80,000 students are in it. So when you give, you're not just giving to help Vlad <laughs> run a YouTube channel, okay? Uh, there's a massiveness that's involved in us reaching masses for Jesus. I met people yesterday that drove from Canada, people who are from Qatar actually, who say that they share the ministry with their unbelieving friends and they see a lot of their unbelieving friends being impacted. They're like, the videos are so simple, they're so easy to understand. So I just wanted to say thank you for everyone and I want to say this is a good soil to sow and give. So as we're fasting, as we're praying, if that's something God puts on your heart, go to pastorvlad.org forward slash partner and partner with me so that we can reach more people for Jesus. You can give one time, you can send in through mail or Cash App, Venmo or PayPal. All the links are in the description. Thank you so much for those that are giving, for those that are praying for this ministry.